faithful in your sight, our Lord, our strength, and our Redeemer. Amen. It's always a pleasure worshipping with you at Grafton Cathedral, and especially today when we reflect on God's gift of life-giving water as part of the Earth Jubilee series this month. As a child, I was called a water baby. I loved body surfing from a young age in Cornwall, very cold water, I must say. And I used to stay in that beautiful ocean all day until my skin was wrinkly and my mother felt she had to rescue me. And the power and the rhythm and sound of the waves hypnotized and energized my spirit as they still do today. And I walk along beaches and hear the tumbling of the surf. I had a passion for swimming and was told I swam like a fish. So I'm in my element on Water Sunday. The preciousness of water took on another meaning for me when I moved from rainy grey England to drought sunny Australia. The absence of such an essential element heightens our longing. Memories of healthy flowing rivers came rushing back, especially when I saw riverbeds that were dry. I've learned some very precious things from our indigenous brothers and sisters who refer to rivers as the arteries of the land. And that's very important when the arteries appear to be so dry sometimes. When the rivers are dry, the country is parched and suffering. And we can also feel spiritually dry. It was against a backdrop of spiritual desolation and hopelessness in 573 BCE, before Christ, that priest and prophet Ezekiel experienced his vision. He was ministering to God's people 25 years in exile in Babylon, Mesopotamia, who were broken and battered in every conceivable way, politically, economically, socially, and spiritually. Ezekiel's vision of hope, where Jerusalem is restored, the temple rebuilt, and God is present again in the sanctuary, came at half a jubilee span of 50 years. Ezekiel directed the eyes of the suffering exiles towards their future liberation. In the first reading today, Ezekiel's vision of the sacred river epitomizes the biblical image of water as a symbol of God's dynamic power, grace, and mercy. A tiny trickle, as the vision goes, a tiny trickle flows from under the threshold of the inner temple entrance, maybe almost not discernible, and then flows out to the outer eastern gate. And as that tiny trickle flows out, it gets bigger and deeper, gaining depth as it crosses the valley, quickly becoming a river that no one can cross. The life-giving waters birth fruiting trees with healing properties, then flow on to transform the salty Dead Sea into a freshwater lake brimming with fresh fish. And those of you who have been to the Dead Sea know how salty that water is. I remember trying to stand up in it and it was really hard. It was very hard to even lie down. I found myself kind of sitting up like in an armchair, bobbing away in this dense, salty water. And yet in Ezekiel's vision, that water becomes fresh enough to sustain life. 
God's presence and grace brings abundant life. And without it, the land can't be cleansed, can't be healed, and can't be resettled. God's people will be settled again in God's productive land. The redemption of humanity will also lead to the restoration of God's creation. The two cannot be separated. It is no coincidence that in the gospel, according to John, Jesus is portrayed in the Jerusalem temple itself at the climax of the Feast of Tabernacles, when in that feast water was symbolically poured out. And by then, by Jesus' day, this ceremony was already interpreted as a symbolic anticipation of the Messiah, the outpouring of the Spirit in fulfillment of various scriptures, including Ezekiel's vision that we read today. In John's narrative, Jesus boldly declares himself to be the source of living water to all who believe in him. Jesus is claiming to be the life-giving, cleansing, healing, eternal power of God that Ezekiel saw in his vision. Again in John's narrative, we see Jesus enact this role in his meeting with the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well, which was a life-saving gift for many generations in a very arid landscape where water was scarce. In John's storytelling style, he likes to highlight people's level of faith. Is this person showing a little bit of faith or a big bit of faith? Or have they moved in their understanding so that their faith is growing? And John's narrative also likes to highlight the identity of Jesus, likes to reveal that identity as the narrative progresses. So in the story of the Samaritan woman at the well, breaking all social conventions, Jesus asks the woman, the non-Jewish woman, for a drink and sparks a conversation about the merits of living water over the limited thirst-quenching properties of well water. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Hearing that, saying that, sends shivers down our spine. The woman is intrigued. She slowly moves from unbelief to eventually wondering whether Jesus is the Christ, is the Messiah, and then invites her whole village to meet Jesus. For those who believe in Jesus, the river of living water speaks of the continuing welling up of the Spirit of God, which brings life and blessings. And through them, through us, who are drinking from those life-giving waters, through us, the blessings flow out to others and gain strength and depth. We are partners with Christ in the redemption and healing of the whole of creation, humanity, flora, fauna, and Earth's precious resources like water. How can we be blessed by the living waters of God's grace and yet neglect the living waters of nature? As stewards of God's creation, we are called to preserve these life-giving waters. So 50 years after my watery childhood, and the first Earth Day, I find myself reflecting on the condition and care of water. 
Globally, we have seen temperatures rise and glaciers melt, causing ecological catastrophes. By 2018, human carelessness had resulted in a floating island of 79,000 tons of plastic in the Pacific Ocean, covering 1.6 million square kilometers. Now, to get your head around that, that's three times the size of France. Oh, you might say, well, how big is France? I haven't worked out how many times that goes into Australia, but it is a huge amount. It is an island of plastic. And that plastic is slowly being removed for recycling. But why did it arrive there? Our carelessness over 40, 50 years maybe. Around 10% of the world's population, that's 780 million people, 780 million do not have access to clean water today. When we take a drink of water from our taps, so easily, conveniently, and knowing it is safe, do we think of 780 million people who can't do the same? According to the Prime Minister's office, as the impact of climate change intensifies, Australia faces increasingly acute long-term water shortages with lower rainfall, rivers drying up, and dam water levels falling. We have seen thousands of fish die and turtle species near extinction because of increased salinity and pollution in our rivers. We have witnessed whole river sections in the Murray-Darling system dry up because of water mismanagement. That's our legacy of the last 50 years. This is not a problem we can simply delegate to our government environmental agencies or the Greens political party, even though they do a great job. People of faith have a God-given imperative to live their lives in respectful care of this precious life-giving commodity. Water-saving measures are not just for periods of drought, but should be used year-round to protect our reserves. At home, I always have a bucket in my shower, whether we've just had rain or not. There's always some area that can be relieved in my garden by that water. And sometimes my neighbors say to me, oh, you're okay in a drought because you have bore. You have a bore well with a pump. But having a bore does not mean we have unlimited supply. It takes tens of thousands of years for rainwater to seep through rock to become underground reservoirs, which humans then recklessly use at an alarming rate. I heard on the radio this morning as I was driving here, um, a farmer on the radio saying that he lives in fear of his boar drying up. So friends, as followers of the giver of eternal living water, let's recommit in this Earth Jubilee year to live our lives in respect and preservation of water. You might like to support one of ABM's water projects or make your voice heard to the Australian environmental agencies. Towards the back of the order of service are some suggestions on how you can save water at home. That's not a an exercise to save money on your water bill, but to preserve this very precious gift that we have been given. 
I urge you to implement what you can, remembering how in, his, in Ezekiel's vision, the trickle, the tiny, tiny effort becomes a mighty river because God is present. God is present in all of us. God is present working through us. Blessings to you all.